Welcome. My name is Maggie. I am on the board of Land to Hand. Um, and we just have a couple of quick like housekeeping things before we get started and you get to hear about all these animals. Um, welcome. This is our eighth Free the Seed. And this is our very first time back in person after two years having to do online. So we're very excited. Welcome. Um, as Andrea said, it is a hybrid. So if you see anything weird happening with the computers, we're just dealing with that over there. Um, but Free the Seeds is a community-based project of Land the Hand Montana's, um, and it's rooted in building sustainable and a, resist, a resilient future through real seeds, real food, and real skills. And our mission is to build a strong community food system that fosters social ways of accessing food, and Free the Seeds is a great way to provide access to all of that to all of our community. Um, it's a zero-waste event, which is amazing. Um, so anything that comes out of the coffee cart at Azul Coffee or the Dancing Burrow food cart is compostable, like silverware, cups, lids, and you'll see kind of stashed around the dirt rich composting bins. So please, please use those composting bins if you get anything from any of those. Dirt Rich will compost them for us as best we can. Um, this is a free event. We love that we can have anyone come and explore it and it participate as much as they can, um, but that does mean it's a lot of community powered activity to get it going. And it does take a lot of time and money to get Free the Seeds up and running. Um, so if you guys are able in any way to either donate time to pack seeds next year, to save your own seeds for next year's seed saving event, um, or if you are able to donate money, uh, everything helps us out here to keep this as a free community event. Um, so you can donate in person at our booth up at the front, or if you go to our website online, we have a big donate button there and you can pop on there and donate. Um, so our biggest sponsors this year, just to give them a shout out since they have put so much into it, is at the growler level, we have the IV element based in whitefish. And then at the pollinator level, we have the Box of Rain Organic Garden Center, Earth Star Farm, the Kalispell Farmers Market, and the FBCC Agriculture Center today. Um, and 50% of the seeds that you have packaged downstairs were saved by community members just like you guys. So it really does come in handy. Um, so that's enough for me. You're not here to hear me talk. <laughs> Without further ado, Meg is here. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. So I am Dr. Meg Thompson. Um, I am a licensed veterinarian in the state of Montana. I'm not currently in practice in the Valley, but I do recommend some different veterinarians that I know uh, provide support for these different animals that we're going to talk about today. So does anybody have currently potbelly pigs or sheep or goats or llamas, camelids? No? Okay. Well, that's actually, you're the, actually the, the people that I want to talk to because my intention for this um, talk today is to have you understand what perhaps might be required of you if you're going to be bringing these types of species into your home. Um, you know, it is much easier to plan than it is to undo often. So without further ado, we will jump in, I think. I see that and I can't get this to forward. Oh, I should have just do the arrow. There it goes, yep, I did, okay. So I have the slide here for legalities because there are rules within most of our city limits here within the Flathead Valley about which species you can have, how many you can have, and what that looks like. And if you come to the chicken talk that I'm doing next hour, we'll talk about that as well. But for potbelly pigs and goats in Kalispell, you can have two if they live in your house. If you have a barn and you live in the city limits, you're not supposed to have any of these species, which is important to know because if you don't have a lot of great neighbors, or you have a contentious relationship, that's fine. Come on in. Um, if you have a contentious relationship with your neighbors, that's how you get into trouble. Um, and so that's something to consider if you're going to be bringing these animals in and you live within the city limits. If you're outside of the city limits, there really are very few rules. There's recommendations. They might say, okay, if you have an acre of land, you could have five sheep. It depends upon where you are, but it's more of a guideline. Nobody's going to come out and say, oh, you have six sheep. You need to get rid of one. Okay. <laughs> so just be aware of where you live. If you live in an HOA, again, often they have very specific rules around who can have these animals. So as I said, just make sure that you do your due diligence and your homework before you bring anybody in. 
Uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about biosecurity. And so I have a definition of biosecurity is, but it's a big word basically saying before you bring these animals in, you really need to understand the diseases that these animals could be coming with and do your best to try and prevent those diseases from coming to your home. So it could be viruses, it could be bacteria. We'll talk about some of those things. And some of these things actually live in the soil forever. So that's a big deal if you're thinking about you know, bringing these species onto a farm that has never had these species before, or if you know that they have, to be aware of what problems those, you know, that farmer might have had prior. Um, so when you think about biosecurity, we're talking about how does that virus, that bacteria, get into your home, into your property? Some of the ways that people may not think about, so I think it's probably pretty intuitive to say, oh yeah, if I buy an animal, they might come with some diseases. But you may not think about the way that your hauler is getting your animals there. If you're buying five sheep, you can't put them in the back of your truck or your car. You're going to have somebody bring them in. Well, if that you know trailer is coming from another place where they had other animals, all of the manure on that trailer, you need to think about where that came from. Those animals are going to be walking in. They're going to be walking off onto your farm, and they can be bringing different types of, of problems. So you, again, be aware of that type of thing. Wildlife, um, often the big thing that I think about with wildlife is more of our domesticated species infecting our wildlife. So like for bighorn sheep, we've had some real problems with pleural pneumonia where our domesticated sheep had it, the bighorn sheep had not been familiar with it and we've had some decimation of those flocks because of that, trans that transmission. But that still can happen the other way. So if you have a fox in your area that has mange, mange can spread to a lot of other species. And so that's something that you just need to be thinking about. How can these other wild animals come in contact with your animals? The last two they have on their feed and water, you think, okay, well, I'm getting feed from a, a reputable dealer. Well, not always. And so again, it, do your due diligence, make sure that it's the right feed for your animal but they can also be infected with different types of bacteria. Listeria is one of the big ones, and that can actually cause real problems for your flock or your herds. It doesn't matter which species you're talking about. Even for cattle, this can be an issue. And if you're not keeping good track of your water and cleaning things out, salmonella actually can grow within your water system and it causes a biofilm. So if you're handling some of this stuff and it's feeling sort of greasy or you know, nasty, that gives you a sign that you need to be sanitizing those types of, of things, whether it be a, a water or a feed trough or whatever those things look like. Um, the last thing that I have on here is about knowing your risks for the individual animal. So if you're gonna be bringing in, let's say some sheep, there are certain sheep diseases that I would recommend that you test those animals for, or that you know that that person who's selling those animals has already tested for. So Yoni's disease, um, OPP, we'll talk a little bit more about these diseases later when we talk about um, sheep and goats, um, abscesses, or if these are all diseases, again, of sheep and goats, these are things that you do not want to bring into your flock, into your home, if you can avoid them. So doing your due diligence about asking questions before you buy an animal is really important, even if you're buying some lambs. I had a client one time who, so I practiced in Pennsylvania, that's where I moved from several years ago. Um, I had a client who said that their way of getting their flock to grow is they would go to auctions and buy ewes that were thin. They would breed the ewes and then they keep the lambs and they sell the ewes. Well, there's a reason those animals are at the auction and there's a reason that those animals are thin. And so often what they were doing was bringing in disease that then they spent hundreds and thousands of dollars with me trying to eradicate. So you might spend a little bit more up front to get these animals, but if you can ensure that they're healthy, then you don't need to have me come out and try and work this out with you, okay? All right, oh, the last thing I'll have on here, and I'll, I always say this to people, if you have like kids that are taking animals out to 4-H and then they're coming back from the 4-H barns, you need to quarantine these animals. You need to keep them away from your larger animals because they've just been exposed to all kinds of other animals and you have no idea what they might have picked up. So give them that 14 to 28 days just to make sure everybody's healthy before you bring them back in and mix them in with everybody. All right, so we're going to talk about potbelly pigs. This is actually one of my pigs. Um, she's no longer with us, but over the years, um, 
I, when I graduated from vet school, this was not my intention to see potbelly pigs. But as I say, I lived in Pennsylvania and I lived near one of the vet schools and they didn't want to see the potbelly pigs. And so they just kept referring all these clients to me. And as a student, I had an experience where I went out with another vet um, to see these potbelly pigs. They're two little piglets. We were going to vaccinate them and we were going to, um, I guess we were also going to look at their feet that day. And the vet went ahead and gave them a couple of injections. And then we spent the next hour just watching these pigs run around. And then she gave them another couple of injections and the pigs just continued to run around. And eventually we got to the point where we had to leave because the pigs never went to sleep and we never got accomplished what we thought we needed to get done. And it was my moment going, oh, there's a better way to do this. And so I started to learn more about these potbelly pigs. And so Connie um, was adopted. She was 12 years old when I adopted her. I adopted her, she and a, a male that came together. I named them Connie and George because the George didn't really care to spend a lot of time with Connie. Most pigs like to be together. So if you put a heat lamp out for them, they'll usually nest together. But George only wanted to be with Connie when it was really cold. Most of the time he preferred his bachelor pad, which is the barn up at the top of the property, as opposed to where she hung out. So these guys have very individual personalities. They can be very fun to train. They'll sit, they'll come, they'll stay. <laughs> Connie would come out and when I would work in my garden, she would lay beside where I was working because she knew that I would bring treats over to her. So she by far and away has been always my favorite pig. She was more like a dog than she was a pig, but she was a lot of fun. So a lot of people will get these little guys and say, oh, they're so cute. Piglets are, piglets are adorable. I don't know if you've ever seen piglets, but you, know, you can hold them. They're so much fun. They run around and they're so cute. But the problem is that they often grow into this. <laughs> These were actually two of my clients' pigs. Um, and they had gotten them again as piglets. And pigs, we, we have a connotation around the word pig because they do gain weight very easily and very quickly. And these guys were not potbelly pigs. They were some sort of cross. but they couldn't, they can't even see. I don't know if you guys can see, but the, over their eyes, they get these fat pads. And so just that physical fat pad caused them to basically be blind. Now I had one client that I would go out to see her pig and I couldn't talk to her when I got there. I would have to whisper because if the pig, she was blind, she couldn't see because she had the fat pads, but she could hear my voice. And if she heard that I was there, she took off because she knew nothing good was going to happen <laughs> when I arrived. So as I say, these guys are super smart. So this is, again, one of my pigs. Um, this was Piper. She was uh, somebody had bought her at a farmer's market and they thought, oh, this will be really cool. And then they decided they didn't want to keep her. And she ended up with somebody else who then kept her in their bathroom and she got behind the toilet and separated the, the pipes and the woman came home to a waterfall from her chandelier in her dining room. So as much as people like to keep these guys in their house, it is my recommendation that you keep them in some something outside because they can be very destructive. And it's just because they're bored. Mm -hmm. If you can give them activities to do, that's great. But that's often like beyond what most people are willing to do. So this is Piper as an adult. This is actually my son when he a few several years ago. Um, but she was about 375 pounds. So she really was not a potbelly pig. She was some sort of cross. So we do have body scoring for potbelly pigs. And we're always aiming for that three to four range. We do body scoring for a lot of different animals, including dogs. Um, you know, it, it's easier said than done. So as we talk about different feed, so Murdoch's carries something called Mana Pro. Missouri is another very well-known feed. Um, Ross Mill Farms is a rescue that actually manages their own type of feed and they'll like send it out to people, ship it out. Um, I don't recommend swine feed because the purpose of most swine producers is to put weight on their animals. They're looking to ship their animals at a certain time. We're not looking to do that with potbelly pigs. So as much as you can stay away from true swine feed, that's better. Um, but the Mana Pro only has one version where they call it complete pig food. And so then you have to be very careful about the portions that you're giving. So I, I mention this again, because if you're thinking about getting a, a pot belly pig, you do really need to manage their food very carefully. Um, these guys love sweets. And so if I have to give medication, I was usually using like donut holes or like uh, vanilla, um, like icing, and they'll take just about anything. 
in this place, including things that don't taste good. All right, and this is the other thing that is important is greens. Just as we are supposed to eat our vegetables, these guys should be eating a fair amount of vegetables. And if you start them early, then they really learn to like them. If you're waiting until they're like 10 or 11, they're gonna be like, yeah, no, I'll take the fruit, but don't give me the greens, just like all of us. I mean, who, who doesn't like the sweet stuff? Um, citrus, not a great thing for this. These guys, they just don't really care for it. All right, um, there are vaccinations that I do recommend for these species. Um, Erysipelas is something that we found in the, in the ground, in the dirt. And so it's a, a normal bacteria that's there, but it can cause problems in pigs if they have like a scratch and then the bacteria gets in there and it, it causes some problems. So again, it's easier in my mind to prevent it um, than have to deal with it. Rabies, we do have rabies in the valley. Um, mostly it's bat rabies. And so we do always recommend that if these animals are gonna be in contact with people, that we do vaccinate them for rabies. And then tetanus, especially if I'm dealing with um, younger animals who are gonna be spayed or neutered, then I'm looking at having the tetanus vaccines. The lepto and the circovirus, again, are more swine like production types of vaccines. And I do have this broken down a little bit. We'll, we'll talk about, I have it listed as this, the single pig versus the Lotharia pig. And I really, my intention is a pig who gets out and can wander around and have additional exposure versus a pig who's kept in a very confined area. It looks a little bit different for disease risk. So some common surgeries, um, we do use, hopefully there's either injectable or gas anesthesia. And if I'm doing a spay, I wanna be doing gas anesthesia. If I'm doing a neuter, I've usually done those, especially if they're young animals in a barn, um, in a home, that type of thing. Dining room tables are great for these kinds of things. <laughs> Sorry. Um, this is a uterus of a pig. It's very, um, it's ventral. So if you, it, as you're opening up the pig, it's right there. They have a, a spiral uh, uterus. Um, and it's not a small surgery because this uh, uterus is pretty big. And then a neuter, as I said, is pretty much straightforward. Um, boars are much harder to neuter because the testicles are pretty large. And so, as I say, when they're babies, it's much easier. It's much quick, quicker surgery. Um, they don't even really require uh, stitches to close anything. Um, parasites are another thing, as I said, about the fox with mange. These guys can pick up mange from those types of species. Um, so if you have a pig that is itchy, this is one of the first things that we'll treat for is just to make sure that they don't have mange. Um, it's a pretty straightforward treatment. If you have a single pig, as I said, that's at your home, this is rarely an issue for you, unless like your dog or your cat has mange and they've managed to, to um, spread it to them. Typically mange is species specific, which means that those mites can't reproduce on that animal. So like if you're talking about a cat mite, it can't reproduce on a pig but it doesn't mean that they can't get it and get itchy. Just like it doesn't mean you guys can't get exposed to it and get itchy. And I have seen you know, human patients come in, I should say human owners come in with their pets who have had mange and they've also gotten it. So just if you have an animal that's itchy like this, it is something that you should be definitely talking to your veterinarian about. And then some common diseases, as I said about the single pig, we'll just go through these a little bit. Um, constipation and dietary indiscretion, these guys will eat anything. So if you have a dead bird out in the yard, they'll eat it and then they don't feel so good. So that ends up being something that we have to treat typically just again to get them feeling a little bit better. Same for dogs and cats. I mean, it's not that different. Overgrown tusks, you see this with boars. So even after they're neutered, these teeth continue to grow. I was saying to Lauren, this is one of my neighbors. I was telling her that I was gonna bring in an example, which I should have, because I wasn't thinking that the kids are gonna be here, but these are tusks that you, that you cut. And I use something called giggly wire. It's actually an orthopedic wire to trim these because you're basically having to saw the tooth off. This is done under anesthesia. Um, I usually I say sedation because I, I have not experienced it, but I've had friends who have had the pig scream and actually inhale that tusk, and then it becomes a real problem. So in my mind, I'd rather sedate them. Usually I'm doing feet as well. Um, can we, we hold questions? I'm sorry, until the end, is that okay? Sure. Okay, yeah, so please remember that question. Um, hoof trimming is the other thing. If you have a pig that's at that three to four body condition score, like I was talking about, you rarely will have to ever have their feet trimmed. So if you think about that ahead of time, you know, it costs money for me to come out, sedate your pig, trim the feet. And once I typically start to trim feet, I usually don't, I'm not able to stop because that becomes an ongoing issue. 
Sometimes it's confirmation, but for most healthy pigs, they don't ever need their, their feet trimmed. So just thinking about that, it's worth it in my mind to keep them at a good weight, and then we don't have to deal with this. Pneumonia is one of the diseases I find kills most of these older pigs. So a pig will usually live for about 15 or 16 years. So not a short-term commitment, sort of like a dog. Um, and if you think about it, again, their, their, their exposure to things that are going to cause respiratory problems often is as babies. And then your lungs don't heal. They actually scar. And so those problems become the problems that cause them to die at the end of their lives. It can also be very similar for people. Um, if you have a pink pig, so sometimes these pot belly pigs are more pink or white than they are black, they can get sunburn. So that's something to think about in the summertime. And then erysipelas, as I mentioned, this can cause um, all kinds of rashes all, all over these pigs. And we usually have to treat it with antibiotics. It's rare that you can't, that you um, can, can cure this without antibiotics. So as I say, vaccination is my preference for this one. And the last one I have on here is osteoarthritis. Some pigs have conformation issues with their elbows. That's a really fairly common issue. Um, but as they get older, just as all of us do, arthritis can affect them. And there are medications that we can use for these guys to keep them comfortable. All right. And then I said about the Lothario pigs. So respiratory infections is my big one. If they're coming in contact with other pigs, it is very common for them to spread things like pastorella or mycoplasma amongst them. And so again, just diseases that it's great to avoid. Lepto is a disease that we can see um, reservoirs are usually raccoons or rodents. And so it can be everywhere. And if this pig is out wandering around, they're more likely to come in contact with lepto. So that's again, the time that I would say it's worthwhile to give a leptospirosis vaccine. Parasites we mentioned real quick, the, the mange and then erysipelas. All right, so we're gonna switch gears now and I'm trying to, be very cognizant of time. I said these to these guys when I was talking about this, I could talk for five hours on these species. So I'm trying to make sure that I give um, each species their, their own uh, specific time and then we'll do questions at the end. Anybody been around llamas or alpacas before? No? Okay, all right. Um, it's been on. Yeah, well, yeah, and we will talk about that. So a llama is a little bit different than an alpaca. They are cousins. Um, alpacas really are bred for their fiber. And if you've ever had a really soft hat or gloves or coat, often alpaca fiber is used. Um, they are specific to looking for the better quality fiber. So the genetics about an alpaca is really focused on that quality of the fiber. Uh, it used to be that some of these animals in the late 90s were selling for $200,000, $300,000. That whole, it was sort of like a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> it was the pyramid where now it's sort of fallen apart. And you can find these guys for, you know, a few hundred dollars, especially if they're a male that's castrated and the people aren't looking to, to breed them. Um, they are very timid little creatures. They're very much fun to be around, um, but they're not very strong versus a llama, who's going to be about double the weight. They're going to be much braver. They're going to be much more likely to spit on you. Um, these guys have three stomachs. So it's called C1, C2, and C3, or three part compartments to their stomachs. When they spit the first time, usually is just saliva and whatever's in their mouth. So it might be feed or grass or whatever. <laughs> and, um, but the second time usually is rumen content. So it's that contents from the first stomach. They don't particularly care to do that. So after they spit, there's like this green stuff all over their mouth and they're, they have their mouths open and they're drooling. And, and so they really do try to avoid spitting on you with that level of, you know, room and contents. But that being said, they will do it. So often when I'm handling these guys, if they have halters on, I put a little towel over the halter that then hangs down over their face. So then they're spitting into the towel. I have to say, I've handled a lot of llamas. Most of them are not like this. The ones that I had to deal with that would spit were usually rescues. And so they've had bad experiences already. So if you have a llama that you're purchasing from somebody and they've used them quite a bit and they've handled them quite a bit, the likelihood of them spitting, unless you're doing something that they don't like, is pretty low. I don't know, have, have you had llamas spit on you before? Yeah. Okay, were you doing something that they didn't like or? I was walking by in his stall and I had some hay there, so I took some of his hay. I held it up for him to eat. Oh. 
It's like it's bad because I tried to feed it food it already had. Yeah. So yeah. And they're also animals that don't like people to invade their space. They're very much space conscious. Um, and so they have to know you before they feel comfortable with you approaching them. So um, there were several, and I, I've had llamas again. That's one of the downsides of being a, a veterinarian who's willing to say, oh, sure, I'll take them. You know, so I've had people who are moving and who said, oh, I can't take these, you know, keep these llamas anymore. And I go home and say to my husband, what do you think? You're like, oh yeah, sure, whatever. So at various times we've had several different animals and I've only ever had one who really didn't like it. Once she got to know us, she she was still the one who was most stand up, standoffish. Everybody else was okay with you being in their space. Um, they do need to be sheared, um, especially in the summertime. And so some of these guys have been trained to be shorn and you don't have to use heavy duty clippers. I mean, it's something like a, there's various sheep shears that you can use um, and it's not hard to do. I will say, um, well, it's not hard. It is definitely something that there's a learning curve on and my llamas never looked good after I was done shearing them, but they were clipped. And so some people will clip all the way from the head all the way down to the top of the legs. Rarely do you ever clip the legs. Um, other people will start at like the bottom of the neck and just um, clip the saddle area. And, and that's all fine. It just depends upon what you're comfortable with and what these guys will let you do. Occasionally, I've had to sedate them to do this. So just some standing sedation. It's not terrible. These guys can be used as herd and like herd guards for sheep and goats, um, mostly for sheep. They are pretty brave. So it's just uh, something to consider. And then I do have a friend who actually uses her llama when she goes elk hunting to pack out the meat. So there is that option as well. Um, their feet, we'll talk about their feet really quick um, in a moment, but they are less um, damaging to the, the ground than a horse hoof because they're pads as opposed to being a solid hoof. Uh, there's body scoring for these guys too. Um, what I typically tell people is if you're taking your hand and you put it on their backbone, if, you're, if your hand's pretty flat, that's too fat a llama. They have too much um, as far as body fat and you know the fat go, builds along their spine. Um, if you have a little bit of a curve, that's more what you're aiming for. And because these guys are so fluffy, it's hard to, to know how fluffy they are versus what the fat content is. And so it's putting the hands on them is really important. They do come with conformational issues. And again, you just have to be aware. It's always good to have your, you know, talk to your vet ahead of purchasing an animal and being aware of that kind of thing. We do vaccinate these guys. Um, rabies, as I said, still something I'm going to, you're going to hear that for all of these species. I do recommend that. These guys are a little bit more sensitive to clostridium and to tetanus. And so that is something that we do also recommend um, annually. And then West Nile virus is a, a virus that we don't have so much here in the Valley. But if you're getting these guys from other places, especially the Midwest or the East Coast, that is a disease that they have. It's spread through mosquitoes, mostly horses are the reservoir for it, but llamas can be, and alpacas can be affected. So it, it's nice to know that they have received a West Nile virus vaccine if you're gonna be purchasing from them from someplace else, just so that they're not bringing, excuse me, bringing it with them. So some of the diseases, again, this is parallelophilostrongylus, which is a meningeal worm. Not something we see a ton here in the Valley, but if you're getting hay from other places, this again is, a situation where white-tailed deer carry it, then slugs or snails pick it up from their droppings. Well, they get into hay when the hay is harvested. And if you're buying hay from other places, then these animals can inadvertently eat one of those infected slugs or snails. This is a terrible disease. Um, I saw it quite a bit back in Pennsylvania. And so there are ways to, to prevent it. But in the situation we're talking about, you just need to be aware if you have an animal that's then down and you're going, they were fine just the other day. What's going on? But oh my goodness, I bought that hay from, you know, Iowa or I bought that hay from Missouri, something like that. Just be aware. Uh, skin diseases. Munge is what is called. That's the name of what we have here. It's a disease that's somewhere between an immuno immunological disease. So it has something to do with the immune system of the animal, as well as um, it seems like bacteria, we don't fully understand it very well, but it seems to be when the animals are stressed, we'll see this more. So if you have a new animal coming in, looks absolutely fine, but then they get there and they start breaking with stuff around their mouth, 
then this is, is something that we can treat. Usually it's not a huge deal, but um, it's probably one of the most common skin diseases uh, besides parasites like mites. And then you're gonna see um, you know, a hair coat that doesn't look so good. And then behavior. Behavior is a big one for llamas. Um, less about alpacas because alpacas, like I said, are typically pretty timid. They do enjoy having herd mates. Um, whereas if you have two males, this is a big deal, especially if the male wasn't neutered early, uh, they can be much more aggressive. And so fighting amongst these llamas can be a real issue. Uh, I had several clients that struggled with this. The females don't seem to fight nearly as much as the males. Teeth trimming, and this is why it's such a big deal. If you can see the little hooks, those are called wolf teeth. And again, we do trim these on the males, especially if they're aggressive with other llamas um, or people. Uh, because those are the ones that can really hurt you. Um, for sheep, goats, and llamas, they all just have bottom teeth in the front, but they can all have terrible bottom teeth, and that really prevents them from eating well. So knowing that they're having these issues, getting a vet involved, trying to correct some of the, the teeth issues as much as you can is important. Um, obviously, this is a pretty significant issue looking at this llama. As I said about hoof trimming, so these guys have two pads. And then they have little hooks on the front, sort of like a dog or a cat, so a claw almost. And so we do clip the claws and we're trying to keep them all even and flat. Um, this is something that you guys can do at home easily, especially if, the, if you do it as they're young and uh, continue to manage it. Uh, but it's just being aware because certainly if it's not managed, it can really cause problems for them to get around. Castration. I do recommend this for all males. And in my experience, it's been the sooner the better. There are some papers out there that say that these guys should be neutered later because um, it changes when their long bones, when those spices close. So the growth of the animal may be impacted. But because the behavior issue has been something that I've seen really significantly in some of these populations, I do recommend castrating earlier. I usually do this as a standing surgery. Some people will actually have them laying down, uh, but I find that if I put a band under, if I have stocks and I put a band under them, I can do the standing under sedation and local anesthetic and the animals then are, you know, recover really quickly. And so most owners prefer that as opposed to having them down and then having to wait for them to get back up. The last thing that I have here is wounds. Certainly if they're out and about, you never know if they're going to get wounded, but if you have animals that aren't getting along and they have, still have those wolf teeth, they can really cause damage to each other. So this is where the CD&T would be important um, because those are all bacteria that can infect a wound like this. The other thing that I do like to mention is during the summer, if they have wounds, fly strike is a real thing. We don't see it as much out here, but it still can happen where the flies will lay their eggs near a wound like this and then you get maggots. It's nasty. So it's always better. Like you can just, there's different types of topicals that you can put on. You can just pick up at Murdoch's and it just keeps the flies off of a wound like that. So the management, the prevention is really critical. So sheep and goats, I think we're doing pretty well. We should have time at the end. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I put these slides up here just to let you know that there's a ton of breeds of sheep and goats. Um, so the ones that I would most commonly see in practice are alpines for the for the goats, alpines, Nubians, boar, goats, uh, Sanin, Oberhostley, and the Toggenbergs are the ones that I would see, again, most frequently. I had a, a woman who actually had a dairy and she milked her Nubians and she used the milk for um, both um, she sold it to various uh, restaurants, but she also would make soap with it. So it, it can be very much a closet industry. You know, if you have a, a niche that you would like to get into, the, it, these are great. And I think the Nubians are some of the best as far as producing for milk. But each of these breeds have their own benefits and downsides. And so you're going to say a oh, boar goat, you don't want to milk a boar goat. They're, they're really intended for meat um, versus something, like I say, for a, a Nubian that it has a much better milk production. When you talk about sheep, there's very fi various fibers that we're looking at. So some sheep, like Suffolk, are more meat sheep. Um, we have Dorpers, which isn't even on this, but that was a breed that was developed in Idaho at the sheep station there. Again, they're looking at fat content, they're looking at meat content because they're looking at lambs for the meat. If you're thinking about fiber, you're thinking about something like a Merino because they have very nice fiber. And if you've ever had a Merino, you know, wool, 
jacket, you know, sweater, the, this very nice soft wool. Um, I have some socks. I recommend them highly. <laughs> um, when you're starting to talk about just pets, there's a, a south down here. So people call them baby doll sheep. I don't know if you've ever heard of those, but they're little. I mean, they, they stand what, maybe two feet. Um, and we had a couple of them. They're a heck of a time to try and shear them because they have several different glands that produce lanolin. And it just was always like gloppy as you're trying to shear them. So there's like pluses and minuses to each of these breeds. And so do your homework to decide what it is that you're looking for. If you're just looking for a backyard sheep, just as a pet, keep the grass short and it doesn't matter so much. But if you have an intentionality in mind, then, you know, consider what, what works for you. For body, con body condition scoring, again, fiber is in the way, the wool's in the way. So you need to put your hands on them. Very similar if you're cupping the back, the spine is processed, then you're gonna be at a pretty good place as far as their weight. Um, if you're buying these guys from somebody else, you wanna make sure that you're putting your hands on them because it, it can be very misleading just to look at them and say, oh yeah, they all look great. All right. Um, same for goats. Um, it's a little bit easier to see, although if you're talking about an Angora goat, they're pretty fluffy. Their fiber is pretty big, um, but put your hands on them. You can often see hip bones in goats, and it doesn't necessarily mean that they're underweight. It may mean that they're older and everything started, gravity started to pull the rumen down. And so they look like they have this huge rumen, but they look very thin along the top line. That's usually an older animal. So again, just FYI, keep in the back of your mind if you're looking to purchase an animal and they're saying, oh yeah, that's two. And you're thinking, mm, I don't think that's two. Okay. The other way that you're really going to be able to tell is their teeth. Again, most vets would be involved in this type of thing if you're going to be purchasing an animal. Or again, you can take it with you and say, oh, let's see, well, let me look at their, their teeth and, and see what things look like. If you see a lot of spaces in between a te and the teeth, that's again, usually an older animal. It's sort of a, just a nice little thing to keep in their back of your mind. Vaccination for these guys, very similar to the llamas and the alpacas. Um, CD&T is critical in these species. I've actually seen tetanus in some sheep. It is not a fun disease. Um, if you're familiar with tetanus, basically it causes them to be paralyzed. And so then they have to be hospitalized and managed for about two weeks until everything starts to, so that the tetanus binds to the nerve receptors. And so once that disconnects, then they start to go back to normal, but all that time you have to manage them. And so it's not a great disease, very expensive disease. It's much easier to prevent rabies. Again, <laughs> I can't tell you that um, how many times I would recommend rabies always. And then the last three at the bottom are vaccines that I hope you never, ever have to administer at, with your flocks, because these are diseases that you basically brought in. So foot rot, this is something that the animals are going to pick up from someplace else and they're going to bring to your farm. They're going to spread it all over your property. And then when it gets wet, like, so let's say May, June, you might have an area that's really damp. The sheep or the goats are walking through it and they start to, you start to see this foot rot and it, it's just better to avoid it. Contagious eczema is uh, actually ORF is the nickname for it. And this causes sores, it's a pox virus. And so mainly around the mouth, if it lambs or kids have it, it can interfere with their ability to nurse. Um, it's almost, it's, it's similar in the idea of like a herpes virus. So they tend to get sores when they're stressed for various reasons. But the bottom line with this disease is you guys can pick it up too. I've actually known people who have gotten sores on their fingers. It doesn't, I mean, it does eventually go away, but why, why expose yourself to it if you don't have to and why have it bring it into your, your flock? Um, and then caseous lymphadenitis is also a bacteria. It causes um, some abscesses and we'll actually see some pictures of that. So for the sheep, we're talking about ovine progressive pneumonia, which is like the plural pneumonia that I was talking about. This is a virus, a lentivirus. Uh, there's a similar uh, kind of virus in goats and it produces signs of arthritis. These are diseases you'll see in older animals typically. And so these are ones that I would recommend you be involving a veterinarian to make sure that they're testing these animals before you bring them in. Because if they're lambs, you may not even know until they're six or seven, and then it's too late because you've already bought it into your flock. So you wanna know ahead of time, do you test for this and are you negative before you buy these animals? 
Uh, Yoni's disease, this is a disease actually we have in cattle. It looks very different in cows versus sheep or goats, um, but it is a chronic wasting type of disease. So again, older animals are gonna have it. It's worthwhile to test or know that the flocks or herds are negative before you bring it in. And then as I mentioned, caseous lymphadenitis. So these guys look at these huge infected abscesses and it can be anywhere, basically it's lymph nodes. And so this isn't a big, well, I should say it is a big deal because you have to lance them and drain them, but then you get the bacteria onto the ground if you're not careful. And this bacteria survives in even in our climates. Eventually they'll get lymph nodes that are involved in their chest and you can't drain them. And that often leads to the death of these animals. Just a great disease to avoid. I did put a couple of slides in here just to remind you that there are some requirements around USDA and APHIS allowance of sheep and goats coming into Montana. So these animals, if you're buying them from Idaho, Wyoming, Utah, whatever, you need to make sure that you're that you have a accredited veterinarian involved and that these animals are tested. So brucellosis is a big one and tuberculosis is the other. We're just, again, looking to try and keep these animals that are coming into our state free and, and keep the animals that we have here protected. And there is also the comment about biting lice. So again, these are animals that should be looked at by a veterinarian and, and ensured that they don't have any transmissible diseases. Same for goats, very similar. Like I say, I, I'm not expecting you guys to, we're not going to walk through all these. I just want you to be aware. Um, and this is why you would involve an accredited veterinarian. So there is a difference between a veterinarian and an accredited ver veterinarian. I should mention that. The accredit accreditation means that we've actually gone through the rules and regulations of the state where we're licensed and understand what those transportation rules are, what the testing rules are. Um, we would be involved if there's like outbreaks of different diseases from time to time. And so there's, it, it's a additional thing that we don't have to do as veterinarians, but a lot of us, if we deal with mixed animals or large animals are accredited. Um, if you're going to take your dog or cat on a plane, it used to be that you needed a health certificate. They really sort of relax that unless you're going to someplace like Hawaii or Japan where there's no rabies. And then you need to have very specific documentation about your animals. So it's all of that type of thing. It's the paperwork behind the scenes. Scrapie, I do have to mention, scrapie is a prion disease. If you're familiar with chronic wasting disease and our cervids, our sheep, and, I mean, our um, elk and deer and moose, um, that is a form of this. So they're sort of cousins. And then mad cow disease would be the bovine version of this. Um, this is, again, a disease you don't want to bring into your flock or your herd. And the USDA is, is really working to eradicate this disease. So they're looking to track all of these animals. So there's specific types of identification that sheep are supposed to have specifically. I say, you know, goats, yes, it would be great, but sheep, the USDA is really starting to crack down on this more. So if you have several animals that you're going to be perhaps, you know, breeding or selling, you need to be aware of this because you need to have them identified in a certain way. Okay. Dewormers, I mentioned this only because we've had serious problems with resistance for different parasites. Certainly not in Montana because we have great cold weather to try and kill off all the eggs. Um, but that being said, if you're buying an animal from the South, so Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, like that whole region, those animals never, ever, ever are clear to parasites because it's warm and those parasites will live in their gut for a long time. And so if you bring that animal into your farm, you could be introducing some parasites that could really be a problem. And what we're ending up happening is that the things that we've used for a long time that have been very safe and efficacious for us now are not working so well. So if you bring, let's say you buy some boar goats from Texas, you bring in Homonchus contortus, which is the worst of these parasites. They suck the blood out of the intestine and can actually kill these animals. Um, Ivermectin hardly works anymore. So the stuff that you can go down to Murdoch's and get isn't really going to work well for you anymore. So it's just, again, being aware, um, having discussions with your veterinarian about what the best dewormer is and how to deworm. There are even um, things, this is a FAMACHA, which is a training that I used to do for other veterinarians, but it was a way to help score whether an animal needed to be treated or not. And this was really focused on these areas where they had such a problem with resistance. Uh, because they couldn't treat everybody because 
these these uh, dewormers just weren't working. And so there were other ways that we were trying to manage them. And so we were doing things like holding the animal off a of feed for 12 hours so that you were minimizing the contents in the room. And so you could actually try and get the dewormer to the worms that were the issue, you know, that instead of having the rumen be full and having it block that, um, making sure that we were weighing the animals and getting the proper dose, all of those types of things. These are all things that, again, your veterinarian can work through with you if you know that you're going to be bringing in an animal from another place that this is a risk. And so my final thoughts, and then we'll go to questions. We did pretty well time-wise, um, is, you know, spend the time ahead, as I said, and just save yourself that, that heartache. Cause I just, you know, my experience has been often working with these owners and then trying to solve for some of these problems when we could have prevented them if they had involved me earlier. So um, there are veterinarians in the Valley, um, Casey Gates, who owns Ponderosa Veterinary Hospital. She and her husband both are very well-versed in any of the species that we just talked about. She's also somebody who knows a lot about chickens. Um, so I do throw her out as a, a reference. There are vet other veterinarians. It just depends upon people's interests that we've had a few that have retired, a few that have left um, that used to do small ruminants. So really just if you're seeing a small animal vet, they're less likely um, to see some of these species. But if you're seeing somebody who does mixed practice, um, especially cattle, often they'll see some of these species. Okay. All right. So let's talk about questions. What questions do you guys have? So I know you had a question. Yes, um, the overgrown tufts. Um, <clears throat> why would you cut the overgrown tufts? So what will happen over time is, again, if it's just like a little bit, I don't usually trim them every year. It just depends upon the pig, but they will eventually grow into the cheeks. Uh -huh. And so then it's a real problem, you know, because just like if you've seen ever the horns of the bighorn sheep that can start to grow inappropriately into the skull, mm -hmm. the same thing can happen with these with these tusks. Um, the other thing is if you have multiple pigs, they can use them to fight. So if you have a couple of males, they're more likely to, to injure each other. And again, they'll gouge themselves or others with them. Okay. So it's more that physical piece. Okay. Good question though. Yes, go ahead. I'm going to get, uh, going back to your first subject, legally, uh, legally uh, where's the best place to get uh, information in regards to having uh, Animals, small herds in a rural area. Okay. So the question was about having the legalities, understanding the legalities um, around having some of these animals in the Kalispell area. So if you look on the borough website, there's actually rules there, they the ordinances, and you can see specifically what's there. If you look on the county website, they'll actually have some comments about the agriculture. And within that, they'll say how many animals are okay on a certain acre size. And that's about it. There's not going to be much beyond that if you're outside of any of the towns, you know, within the, the valley. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Do you have a question over here? Yeah, this goes a little bit outside of the backyard, but I'm curious, among all of the species of goats, is there any one that is better at that's a good question. So the question is, I'm um, eating weeds. Which which species of goat is better for eating weeds? And it's it's a good question. So what I will say about sheep and goats is sheep are the grazers and goats are the browsers, and they do prefer to eat most weeds. Um, if you're talking about pygmy goats, they're not always as great because they're small and they don't have that access. Um, but Again, Toggenberg, Oberhostley, Nubian boar, any of those really do prefer to eat the weeds. And if you've paid attention to any of the stuff that's happened with the wildfires in California, the only reason I pay attention is because they're using goats now to try to mitigate some of the weed growth. And it, it's working very well because that's goat's preference. Um, the other thing that I will add is if you have ornamental flowers in your house, so um, use or azalea, rhododendron, any of the uh, mountain laurel, any of those that are in that same family, incredibly toxic to sheep and goats. So I don't like, I never even had them on my property because I never wanted to take the chance of my animals getting loose and exposing themselves to them. I, I just have kept them away from that type of thing. Deer, deer eat up great. I don't understand how deer, can, you know, ingest these things. You is toxic to just about every other species, but deer do just fine with it. 
So it's just being, again, aware of that. Um, those are the big ones for me as far as avoidance. But yeah, there's very few species of, of goat that wouldn't work for what you're looking for. One more question. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to start having goats for weeds, mm -hmm. I'm assuming that goats would like to be at least in a pair. I mean, how many goats makes a good family? Yes. Yeah, that's a good question as well. Um, so the question is, how many goats should you have to keep them happy? Um, and, and I will say that it's interesting because goats are not ones that necessarily have to be with another goat as long as you have other species. So um, racehorses often will have a goat that keeps them company in their stall, and that seems to work really well for goats. Um, I've never had less than two at a time, because like you, I think, oh, wait, they, they like to sort of hang out with their other goat friends. Yeah. Um, so that that's sort of just been my rule of thumb. But that being said, I had several clients that had a goat and they had dogs and the goat sort of hung out with the dogs and they were good with that. So, you know, yeah. I, I, again, I, I've had all kinds of experiences <laughs> with the owners doing different things with their animals. So good question, though. Anybody else for questions? I hope you guys found this helpful. Yes, go ahead. A question that mm -hmm. also might be outside of the scope a little bit, but as far as like um, herding dogs, dogs that herd, like is there a specific, do you find like, for example, let's say a corgi, do you think that a corgi is as small as they are, do they actually help to actually do the job in your experience with dogs? <laughs> So the question is about herding dogs and specifically corgis and how effective they are at herding these animals. Um, so I do have the reason I'm laughing is because I've had several dogs that I have tried to use as herding dogs. Um, so I what I spent time at the USDA sheep station and I came home with a sheep. Well, she was a, a border collie. The mother had always herded cattle and the father had always herded sheep. And I was like, cool. Well, I got her home and she only ever wanted to herd my horses. She was not interested in my goats or sheep because I thought, okay, this is great. I'll go out. And often there were times where I would spend hours with the owner trying to round the animals up because they just hadn't brought them in before I was due to see there. So I thought, oh, this will be a great thing. I can bring the dog out just didn't work that way. So it really depends upon the temperament of the dog would be the first thing. Corgis are herding dogs. I mean, it's sort of surprising because they do have sh such short little legs, but that's their innate preference is to herd. So wouldn't be a bad thing to try, but I can't say that all corgis are gonna do a good job just based upon my own experience with my own dogs. Okay, sure. You had another question? Mm -hmm. uh yeah, along the same lines, what, would, what breed would you recommend for like livestock mm -hmm. herding dog? Okay, the question is about what um, breed of dog would be a better choice for herding. And it okay, really... Like protecting livestock. Oh, for protecting. Okay, so um, again, out at the sheep station, they had Anatolian Shepherds and Great Pyrenees are two that are very well suited to protect flocks and herds like that. Um, the, the key to that is you have to raise the puppy with the sheep. Oh. So they can't come in the house. Um, I also brought one of those home with me from the sheep station, <laughs> a great Pyrenees. And I made the mistake of letting them in the house. And once he figured out what the sofa was, he never wanted to go back to the barn. So that's why I say it's really important that that's their job and that's all that they do. Um, and that your kids realize that they can't be, you know, couch potatoes with them on the sofa because it just doesn't work out well. Okay. Good question there. Anybody else? Well, I'm hoping that this gave you some food for thought and that as you, if you decide to move forward with uh, getting some of these species that, you know, again, do some homework. There's a lot of resources out there. The USDA has a lot of resources for, you know, transmissible diseases. Make sure you're going to a reputable website as you're gathering this information, because there's a lot of stuff out there that is not true. So yes, go ahead. One more question. Like, we're wanting to go explore feeds and we have five acres of mm -hmm. feeds. How much supplemental food is an additional food? Yeah, now that's an excellent question. So how much supplemental food do um, goats need when they're working on weeds? During the summer, they're not going to need much. Certainly, you know, fresh water is always critical. But, it, you know, the only reason I would say give them anything is just to make sure that they're coming in, you're checking on them, you're, you're getting an opportunity to, to see them, and it motivates them to come in. 
because otherwise they're just going to hang out wherever and they're not necessarily going to come in for you to take a look at them. Um, but yeah, when growth is happening quickly, that's going to really be enough for them. But if you think about how our summers go, <laughs> that might be June and July, but then by August, we've had such heat that things are slowing down and maybe not growing as fast and you might have to start supplementing there. Okay. Certainly, you know, cold is a real thing here and, you know, you need to think about how you're going to be supplementing them and keeping them warm um, during the winter. They live outside in the time? They can, they can, as long as you can, they have access to a barn where, yeah, shelter. And again, most of these animals, less for the goats, more for the sheep and the llamas, their, you know, fiber is really going to keep them warm most of the, of the time. And the other thing is their rumens give off heat. And so just that whole process of digesting their food keeps them warm as well. So as long as they have a place to get in out of the weather, usually they're pretty good. Unless it's, I mean, if it's 40 below, it's really nice to provide them with a little bit of heat. You know, good question though. Sorry, I meant to say that was uh, about whether or not they can um, weather well here in the wintertime. All right, anybody else? Okay, we're coming to the bottom of the hour. So I think you guys have about 15 minutes until the next... Um, presentation start. If you're interested in chickens, I think I'm a couple doors down that way. And we'll talk about chickens next. <laughs> all right. Thank you all.